first a DC alternator or DC generator. Um, either of these two devices are on board the aircraft. Their purpose in life is so that you can have a whole bunch of electrical power at your disposal so you can run, run lots and lots of stuff. How does it do it? What's its function? It's an energy conversion device. Oh no, not another energy conversion device. In this case, it takes kinetic energy or rotating energy off of the engine and changes it into electrical energy. In fact, you could think of a DC alternator or DC generator as being very similar to a hydraulic pump in that it's just an energy conversion device driven by the engine to take that rotating or kinetic energy and change it into a different type of energy that we can now transfer through the airframe and use used to power different components on the far end, except instead of running actuators with hydraulics, we're going to run electric motors and a whole bunch of other things with this electricity. Here's a picture, classic alternator. The ones in airplanes look just like the ones in cars. In fact, some of them are built by the same companies. And you can see here that uh, there's a pulley to be driven by the engines because it needs that engine. There's a fan here. It blows air through the alternator because it gets hot because we're going to run electricity through these wires. It's going to pump a lot of electricity through those wires so those wires are going to get hot. And of course it's going to take horsepower from the engine because it needs this kinetic energy from somewhere. So it's either going to have to be bolted into the engine or driven off of a fan belt. Here's the cowling off of an aircraft and you can see the alternator here. It's painted red and this is pretty similar to like in a 172 except usually in a 172 they put the alternator a little higher. But there's a pulley on the engine and there's a pulley on the alternator and here's the fan belt so we can get energy off of the engine. Alternators and generators work off of the theory of electromagnetic induction. You need those three things. You need conductors, you need uh, lines of flux, and you need relative motion between the two. That is, you need the fly lines of flux to cross the conductor, or you need conductor to cross the lines of flux. So, conductors, that's we need wires, and flux, we need magnets, and pretty much we're going to use electromagnets because we can control the strength of an electromagnet, which will end up controlling how much electrical energy we get out of it. And we definitely want to control it. Hey, how do we do it? A variable strength electromagnet. If you have a coil and you run amps through it, you're going to get lines of flux emanating off of that coil. If you double how many amps go through it, you'll double how many lines of flux there are. So in an alternator or a generator, we can control how much energy and we're going to keep the voltage constant. So effectively, we're just going to change the amps, increase or decrease the amps in output by changing the strength of this electromagnet. And the schematic symbol is really, really hard. Let's see, I'll back up a couple so I can have some, sp some space. Electrical symbol for an alternator or a generator. It's going to be a circle with the letter G and a couple of square bumps coming off of it. There, that's a generator or an alternator. Voltage regulator. We need something to keep the voltage constant. If the voltage in the system goes too high, it could fry some components. If the voltage goes too low, they won't work well or they won't work at all. So we need the voltage to stay pretty constant. It's very similar to a uh, pressure regulating valve or a pressure regulator in a hydraulic system next to the pump. We want just enough fluid to go into the hydraulic system to keep the pressure up, but not too much so the pressure doesn't go too high. So same with the voltage regulator. It's actually going to be set, uh, why it's there is to keep the voltage constant, and it's going to do it by changing or controlling the output of the alternator generator. If we turn more things on, the voltage regulator is going to tell the alternator or generator to put out more amps to keep the voltage up. It's just like water pressure in a house. If we run through a house turning on all the faucets, the water pressure will go down. So in one way to bring that water pressure back up is to pump more water into the house. The, the metaphor works pretty good with generators and alternators. The voltage regulator is going to be measuring the voltage and it's going to tell the alternator or generator to put out more or less amps. And I think I have a picture right here. Oh. First, regulator does what two things? One, it measures bus bar voltage. And the second thing, 
is it uh, changes the amp output of the generator or alternator and I'm going to talk about this in more detail here shortly. There's a picture of a regulator, there's parts inside and there's coils of wire and I'll talk about that a little bit more. DC generators. We're going to now differentiate a little bit between DC generators and DC alternators. If I can get this to go. There we go. You're going to find DC generators uh, on five different types of uh, five different types of aircraft. Uh, piston-powered airplanes and piston-powered helicopters that were built before, and that's an approximate number, 1965, had generators on them. And this coincides pretty much the same as it does with cars. If you look at cars in the mid-1960s, they changed over from having generators to having alternators, and we're going to get into those reasons here shortly. And then you're going to find DC generator, but you're probably going, Mr. Johnson, I'm not going to fly a pre-1965 reciprocating airplane or pre-1965 reciprocating helicopter, so I have to, how come I have to know about DC generators? <laughs> well, it's because there are other aircraft that are being built brand new right now that do have DC generators, and they are small turboprops, small business jets, and small turbine helicopters. So they're all small small turboprops, small business jets, and if you want to abbreviate biz and call it biz jets, that would be fine, and then small turbine helicopters. These all have DC generators on them, and they're being built brand new, and I'm going to, so that's why we're going to make sure you understand about DC generators, is because you're likely to fly one of those aircraft as your first turbine-powered aircraft. Now in a DC generator, in addition to having a variable strength electromagnet, there's also a um, permanent magnet. Here is a diagram of a DC generator. I'm not going to ask you to draw this on the test, and I'm not going to ask you to draw this in the homework, although if you want to hit pause and draw it, that's fine with me. This right here is the voltage regulator, and here is our bus bar. We'll just say it's 14 volts DC. And of course, you'll notice the voltage regulator is connected to the bus bar. The other side of the voltage regulator is connected to ground, so it can measure that potential difference, the pressure difference, the, the, the voltage. And right here, this core, I guess I could change ink colors here. Right here, this right here, this is the core. And in a DC generator, it ha is a permanent magnet. In fact, from now on, in the rest of your career as a pilot, when you see the word generator, you're going to go, aha, permanent magnet. Well, this permanent magnet is going to generate lines of flux. But most of the lines of flux, most of the lines of flux are from, coming from this right here. And this is the field. And you're going, Mr. Johnson, that looks like a coil to me. How come you're calling it a field? Well, it's because it generates lines of flux, that is, a magnetic field. And how big this field is, that is, how strong it is, that is, how many lines of flux, that is entirely dependent upon how many amps go through it. So amps go from negative to positive. Amps are going to go through here, go through the coil, and through the voltage regulator to the bus bar and we'll talk about where that power comes from here shortly. So if we double how many amps there are going through it, we can double how many lines of flux there are. This coil right here, we're going to call it the output winding. Technically it's the armature, but we're pilots and we're going to label this as something that uh, makes a lot of sense. This output winding, that's the part that gets spun by the engine. You can think of it having a hinge in the middle and it's spinning around. So these wires of the coil are crossing the lines of flux. Wow, electromagnetic induction, man. That's where we have conductors crossing lines of flux. Hey, that crossing, there's our relative motion. So we're going to actually induce a current flow in this output winding. So we're going to actually induce a current flow in this output winding, and that's actually where the electrons can go. Also, if we have things hooked up to the bus bar, say a light bulb, these electrons can go through the light bulb and of course they're going to get pushed. They can go through the field and through the voltage regulator 
and they can get pushed. So this output winding, it's going to be pulling electrons in and on this side, on the plus side, the side that's hooked to the bus bar, and it's going to be pushing electrons out on the negative side. So anything that's connected to a ground and it's connected to the bus bar, electrons can travel. Let's get rid of some of this stuff here. Okay, so let's call this steady state here for a minute. Let's say that the engine is spinning. So if the engine is spinning, and this is geared to the engine, or it's got a fan belt spinning it, this output winding is spinning around, and it's crossing the lines of flux, and amps are getting produced. Um, some of these amps, like I said a minute ago, can go through the field. Now, let's just say we turn a bunch of things on. Turn on a landing light, and we turn on a motor. Now, what's going to happen? If this was a water pressure in our house and we turned on faucets, the water pressure would go down. Well, the voltage regulator over here, the voltage regulator over here, it's connected to the positive, to the bus bar, and it's also connected to the ground. So it's measuring that pressure. If the, uh, sorry, I erased that E, I got to put the E in there. If the pressure goes down, the voltage regulator is going to allow more electrons to go through it. That is, it's essentially works like having a variable resistor in here. And if the pressure goes too down, down, down too low, now this uh, voltage regulator is going to be set at 13.5 to uh, 14 volts DC, or exactly double that if it's in an airplane that's 28 volts. In that case, it would be 27 to 28 volts DC. And if it goes below wherever it's set at, let's say it goes down to 13, the voltage regulator is going to increase, is going to crank this up and reduce the resistance. So whatever electrons are available, more of them go through the field winding, more of them go through the field winding, and we get more lines of flux. If this output winding is spinning around, now it's crossing more lines of flux than before, it's going to output more amps. That's just like in your house, if you turn on a bunch of faucets and the water pressure goes down, you can bring the water pressure back up if you pump more water into the house. So effectively, the voltage regulator sensing the low pressure is m telling the output winding, hey, pump out more water molecules, or in this case, it's electrons. And it tells it to do it by reducing the resistance between negative and positive on the bus bar, and it allows more electrons to go through the field and get more lines of flux. More lines of flux, more output. Now let's say we turn these things off. We turn these things off. The output winding is generating a bunch of electrons. It's like running through your house and all the faucets are on, but now you run through the house and you bring a bunch of friends over and have everybody turn the water faucets off at the same time. The water pressure inside the house would go up a little bit. Well, the voltage regulator, it's measuring pressure connected to positive and negative. If it sees that the voltage is going too high, it's going to reduce the number of electrons. That is, it's going to increase the number of resi the resistance and it's going to get reduce some of the, the amount of amps going through it and it's going to get rid of some of the lines of flux and so now when the output winding spins around it crosses less lines of flux so it's going to put out less amps so every time you turn something on or off the, the pre voltage between the bus bar and negative is going to change the voltage regulator is going to change its resistance allow more or less electrons through the field and so the output winding even if it's spinning around at the same rpm because you haven't changed engine rpm even if it's spinning at the same rpm we can either put out more or less amps and this happens over and over and over again the other way is to spin the output winding faster. Let's say you push forward on the throttle and you spin this faster. If we spin it twice as fast and it crosses the same lines of flux, it'll produce twice as many lines of flux. If it spins twice, correction, if it spins twice as fast across the same lines of flux, it'll produce twice as many amps. Well, if we pump too much amps into the system, the voltage would go too high, but again, the voltage regulator is measuring the difference between the bus bar and ground, so if the voltage goes too high, it'll again reduce how many amps goes through the field and reduce how many lines of flux. So if it spins faster, it just won't have as many lines of flux to go in. And of course, the opposite is true. If we spin the output winding slower, and we aren't producing enough amps, then the voltage regulator will measure the lower voltage, allow more amps to go through, get more lines of flux, and even though the output winding is spinning slower, if it crosses more lines of flux, 
it'll put more amps out. So every time we change engine RPM, the voltage regulator is going to measure the change in voltage and change the strength of this electromagnet. So this field is pretty much every time we turn something on or off and every time we change engine RPM, the field is going to have to have its strength changed by the voltage regulator so we get the correct number of amps being produced by the output winding. Now, the core, which is a permanent magnet, <coughs> excuse me, the core is a permanent magnet. Now remember, this is a DC generator. Remember, that's the key word. If it's a generator, that means the core is a permanent magnet. These two lines are symbolizing a permanent magnet. And they have a few lines of flux, not nearly as strong as the field would have if we let lots and lots of electrons go through it. So let's just say for fun, we go out to this pre-1965 helicopter, piston helicopter, or this pre-1965 uh, piston-powered airplane. So we got a 1964 Cessna 172, and the battery's dead. So we need to get the engine started. So we hand prop the engine because the magnetos will run just fine. They don't the magnetos aren't hooked into the electrical system. We get the engine running. So if the engine is running, that means that the output winding is spinning. And this output winding will cross, let's just say, one line of flux coming off of this core. Well, it let's just say it induces 0.1 amp. Guess what? Th these amps can go through the field. And now the field gets an extra line of flux. Now as the output winding crosses the lines of flux, there's two lines of flux, one from the permanent magnet and one from the field. Now it'll produce 0.2 amps. So we get more amps. More amps through here, more lines of flux. The output winding crosses more lines of flux, we get more amps. So if we had a voltmeter or an ammeter hooked up, we'd see this voltmeter down at zero and the ammeter down at zero and over the course of three, four, five, six seconds this voltmeter would rise up to that 13.5 and the ammeter would rise up to whatever it normally would because now the amperage that's, go that's being produced by the output winding is being allowed to travel through the field and generate lines of flux and that allows more amps to be produced by the field and more of these amps because this voltage regulator is going to be reading zero volts and it's going to go it's going to reduce the resistance dramatically it's going to reduce the resistance a lot to allow the maximum amount of amps to go through as possible so what's going to happen is the voltage will rise and as it gets up close to 13 and a half or 14 or 27 to 28 the voltage regulator will go back into normal operation and restrict how many amps to go to go through it to keep that voltage constant so what i'm trying to get at is if it's a generator we have a permanent magnet inside of the generator and that makes this thing self-exciting. If all we did was turn on the generator switch and didn't turn on the battery, this would start working and the bus bar would be powered and once that four, five, six seconds is up and the volts come up to normal, we could turn, hook up everything we, anything we wanted to to the bus bar and everything would work just fine because the generator will get itself going. get back to this momentarily. Yep, and there it is. The core is a permanent magnet and that means you're self-exciting. Now let's take a peek at these pictures. Alright, here's the inside of a generator. That part that spins around, the output winding. I oversimplified the drawing. There's actually a whole bunch of coils. There's a piece of copper strip right here. This copper strip, let's see, let's try a different ink color this copper strip right here it goes in here and there's got a winding in here and it comes out on the opposite side you can't see it it's on the opposite side and we're going to to uh, this is the part that the lines of flux are going to cross and we're going to have to pick up the electricity one of these will be positive the other will be negative just like here one of these was positive and the other side was negative Here we have some brushes. I need a better color. Let's try dark green. This right here is a carbon brush. This right here is a carbon brush. So if this whole assembly over here gets slid over, 
there's going to be a carbon brush up here touching this piece of copper and another carbon brush touching this piece of copper so that wire going around in there this is positive and this is negative so the electrons can get come out and the electrons can get can come in and these things are spring loaded so when this slides on the carbon brushes are pushed against the copper one of the things you'll notice is that between the copper is some insulation it's mica you don't have to write that down but this surface isn't smooth so as this rotates remember the output winding is the part that spins as it rotates the brushes are going to wear down and that's okay you got to replace them every now and then they're made out of carbon um, it's an uneven surface so you can only spin this around at about 6,000 RPMs because if you spin it too much faster than that remember there's a spring pushing on this uh, this brush this brush down here there's a spring pushing on it but you spin this faster and faster and faster it hits one of these bumps and the carbon bounces up a little tiny bit and then the spring pushes it back down but if this is spinning so fast that the time it takes to get pushed back down it missed one of the copper strips it's not going to work well so because of this commutator system here and you don't have to write down the word commutator but this is the commutator because of the commutator being an uneven surface and at too fast of a speed the carbon brushes bounce around we're pretty much stuck with a DC generator we can't spin it much faster than 6000 RPMs if we want it to still work here's another piece of a DC generator here right here is a permanent magnet and around it is a field and so that here's the field that's the coil of wires and the permanent magnet is right there so there we are now this I oversimplified the drawing this actually has one over here one over here one over here it's got four of them but as you can see there's a permanent magnet actually inside of the field winding and what's actually occurring is that the lines of flux are crossing like this so the armature or the uh, output winding it's rotating around inside of it and so you'll notice right at this point right here we're crossing a whole bunch of lines of flux all at once so that's actually the electromagnetic induction is occurring four places at once but let's not to worry about the complexity of it let's just understand that we have a controllable electromagnet that's the field winding and it'll change the strength of or how many lines of flux there are and then when the output winding crosses it it can cross more or less lines of flux and here's how it all gets put together here's the field and the ma the permanent magnet which is the core and then here's the brushes that are going to get pushed in there it's going to get slid over to hit the commutator and then this whole thing goes down into the middle of between the fields now low engine RPM remember we're talking DC generators actually what we're talking about for the moment what we're talking about is these reciprocating airplanes and reciprocating helicopters that are pre-1965 so let's say we have an engine and it's either got a propeller on it or the shaft is going to the transmission of this helicopter and we'll say that we've got this DC generator stuck on the back if we look at the RPM of the engine and we look at red line generally speaking the red lines up over here and it's a little bit less than 3000 say 2700 so if we know that this engine is going to be spinning at a little under 3000 and we know we don't want to go over 6000 rpm on the generator then we can gear this to about 1 to 2 or 2 to 1 that is the gear ratio in here will be so that the generator spins about twice as fast as the engine so that way when we get up to red line we're not exceeding 6000 RPMs well if we've got this engine and we pull it back to idle we'll just say idle is at 600 RPM 600 over 13 over 3000 is a 6 going to 35 times so this is one-fifth or of the RPMs or that's the same as about 20 percent
So we're going to idle this engine when we pull it back to idle. We're going to idle it at about 20% of what it could spin at. Well, that, what that means is now the generator is spinning at 20%. So if we have 6,000 times 0.2, a fifth of 6,000 is going to be a little bit over 1,000. 2 times 6 is 12. So I bet you that's going to be 1,200 RPM. So now the question becomes, if we pull the engine down here to idle, now the generator, instead of spinning at 6,000, now the generator is really only spinning at 1,200 RPMs. It's not going to be producing nearly as much uh, amps, nearly as many amps as it would if it was spinning at a really, really high RPM. So let's try it like this. Let's see. Well, that's not what I wanted. Hang on. Don't go away. There we go. That's what I want. Now, let's look at generator RPM versus amps. And let's say that this is at 6,000, which of course is red line. Remember, this is generator RPM. This is going to go up. There we go. This is going to go up, and it usually levels off a little bit before you get to 6,000. But we're only, there's half, there's 25, here's 20%, which that's this 1,200 that when the engine's at idle at 600 RPM, the generator's spinning about twice as fast. So how many amps can the generator produce when the engine is only spinning at 20% and the generator is only spinning at 20% compared to its maximum available. So let's just say we can get 100 amps out of it when the engine is spinning at above 60 or 70%. Down here at 20% when the engine's at idle, according to this graph, we're going to get less than half. We're going to get maybe a third of the amps that we would otherwise. If we've got a whole bunch of avionics turned on, then it's very likely that the generator can't put out enough amps and we're going to get a low voltage light. In fact, I flew a 1959 Cessna 150, had a generator on it. When it came out of the factory, it had just had one comm radio and some position lights and a beacon. But in, you know, 30 years later, when I'm flying this 1959 Cessna 150 with a uh, DC generator on it, it had a big radio stack, two nav comms, transponder, had extra strobe lights. Boy, how do you turn all that stuff on, taxiing out to the runway, and you're only at 600 RPM, and the need for amps is up here, and then the generator will only put out this much. Then guess what? The low voltage light came on all the time, and I'd actually have to rev the engine up. I'd have to actually increase the RPM to about 1,100 RPM which is about a third of the way of, of red line RPM before I could get the low voltage light to come on. That was okay. It was normal because I understood what was going on. Now, here's a very interesting question now. And that question is, I'll get to it here shortly, get past the pictures, is what about the low engine RPM effects on turbines? Hmm. Well, let's play turbines. I'd erase it all on the slide, but I want to keep that diagram up there at the top. Now, if you've taken a class about jet engines, you know something about jet engines, and that is they don't idle down there at 20%. Jet engines typically idle if uh, if down here is at zero, and here's a hundred percent redline engine RPM. Jet engines typically idle at about 50 percent RPM. So let's say we have a jet engine and we'll just call it uh, a turboprop, a small turboprop. And here's the inside of the engine. You don't have to draw the inside of the engine on the test. And coming off of the main shaft goes to an accessory section and the accessory section is going to drive this DC generator and we'll get to it here on this chapter. It's going to be a DC starter generator. So when the engine is designed to spin at 100% RPM, 
we want this uh, generator to be spinning around at 6,000. So if we pull the engine back to idle at 50% RPM, then that means the generator is now going to be doing 3,000 RPM, or half of its rated uh, RPM. So, let's see if I can get to it fast. Get rid of that junk so I can see it. Oops, too far. There we are. If we pull the engine back to 50% RPM, so now the generator is spinning at 3,000, here's the 50%. It's the, so now the generator is spinning at, at half of its rated RPM. Look how many amps we can get out of it. We can get almost all the amps out of it. We can get nearly 90% out of it. So in a jet engine, whether it's a small turboprop, a small turbofan like on a bizjet, or a small turbine helicopter, in all three of those cases, if the engine is idling f pretty fast, which it for sure is going to, then we can turn all kinds of stuff on because at 50% engine RPM we're now at 50% generator RPM and we can get lots and lots of amps lots and lots of amps so we don't have this problem with DC generators on turbine engines because turbine engines idle so fast that the generator is spinning pretty fast now this last line here DC starter generators are found on what three type I mentioned. It's a starter and it's a generator. That is during engine start, it's an engine it's a motor. It's an energy conversion device. It takes electrical power and converts it into kinetic energy. After you get it started, you flip the switches and you turn this DC starter motor into a DC generator. Now it takes kinetic energy off of the engine and and turns it into electricity. These three type aircraft are small turboprops, small business jets, and small turbine powered helicopters. They have primarily DC power systems, they need DC generators, but you can save weight because you can have one component that goes into the engine and half well, during start it's the starter, during the rest of the time it's a generator and you can save some weight. And here is a picture of a small turbine engine and somewhere in there is the shaft. The shaft comes down to the accessory gearbox down here and here is the DC starter generator that goes into that accessory section so during start power leaves the starter and makes the engine spin and then during the rest of the time the engine spins and power goes in the opposite direction so we can get electricity out of the starter generator it's always connected to the engine you can't disconnect it and I've never seen one on a fan belt <coughs> excuse me okay now that you know everything you always want to know about DC generators but we're afraid to ask, now it's DC alternator time. Dun, dun, dun. Where are you going to find DC alternators? Well, on all those reciprocating powered airplanes and reciprocating helicopters that were built after 1965. Again, that 1965 is a generic number. It's not exact, but it's pretty good mid-60s. So, the airplanes you're used to flying, the helicopters you're used to flying, if they're a piston engine job and they're made after the mid-60s, instead of having DC generators, they have DC alternators. And you're going, ah, Mr. Johnson, it doesn't have the word generator in the title. Hmm, I wonder if it still has a permanent magnet, and if you're thinking about that, Yahoo, and you're right if you thought that no, it doesn't. Here is a picture. It's pretty typical on light aircraft and light helicopters that are piston-powered. You can see the flywheel here. The propeller is going to be out here in the front, and here's a fan belt. Or we call them fan belts, but in this case it's driving an alternator. So here's the pulley, and here's the alternator. You can actually see the red insulation on the wires inside the alternator. They tend to get hot, so it's nice to have air blowing through it. we got another picture here. Here's an alternator. Instead of being mounted on the front of the engine, it's mounted on the back. This is actually the firewall, and the cockpit is that away. way and this is the back of the engine right here this is the engine accessory case and here is the last cylinder the front of the engine is to the left and off of the accessory case they've got a pulley coming out here in the back and there's actually a fan belt running a pulley to drive the alternator so you could have an alternator with a fan belt on the back of the engine and oh wait here's the front of the engine here's the propeller flange on the front of the crankshaft that the, the propeller is going to get bolted to. Here are the cylinders. This is a six cylinder job, three on each side. You can see the back of the firewall back here. The instrument, the windshield would go up from the top from there. And here's an alternator, but it's bolted directly into the engine. You'd be able to see that on your pre flight. You'd have a big old hole right here and a big old hole right here. You'd actually be able to see the alternator, but hey, 
no fan belt to worry about. I kind of like that. And then here's the last insulation I could find a picture of. This is the back of the engine. Here's a magneto. Here's another magneto. Here's actually a starter motor bolted into the accessory section of the engine. Here's an oil cooler so some of the air coming in from the front of the engine can go down through the oil cooler. And here are three cylinders, and with three on each side. We can't see the other three. And then down here is the oil filter. And sure enough, here is an alternator bolted right smack directly into the engine without any belts. So there's a lot of different ways you can hook an alternator up to an airplane engine. Typically on cars, it's with a fan belt. Okay, here is a diagram of a DC alternator. And if you thought that since the word generator is not there, it doesn't have a permanent magnet, you'd be correct. In fact, this right here, this core, is made out of soft iron, no carbon, and so no retentivity. All right, so we got a core, we got the voltage regulator. The voltage regulator does the same thing. We have a field. It prov amps go through it. I before E except after C. Okay. It has lines of flux coming off of it. In this case, though, we're going to rotate the field, and in reality, this field is stuck rotating around inside of the output windings. And these lines of flux are going to be like this. And so as it rotates, it's going to cross these wires, so we'll have electromagnetic induction, because we'll have lines of flux crossing the wire, and it's going to induce current flow in the output windings but let's follow them. Now, what I find interesting is here's the coil, here's the field on the inside. This is the North Pole, this is the South Pole. As the North Pole crosses these lines of flux, it's going to cause current flow in one direction. But as the South Pole comes around and the lines of flux off of the South Pole cross it, it's going to induce current flow in the opposite direction. It's going to be alternating current. Well, wait a minute, this is a DC alternator. We need the output in our small airplane, or a small helicopter, or blimp, if you will. I'm sure there's some other flying machine. Oh, yeah, a gyrocopter, a gyroplane. We need this to be direct current. So we've got to convert or rectify this alternating current into direct current. So we're going to do it with a set of diodes. These six diodes together here are going to rectify or act as a rectifier and change the AC into DC. So let's try a different color just because it would be fun. Let's follow one electron as it goes in this direction. Here comes electron, comes up to this intersection. And remember, electrons can only travel opposite the direction of the arrow. So if electrons try to go against the, with the arrow, they can't do it. They can't go in that direction. They can only go out this direction. And these three wires are connected to ground. So yeah, the ground is negative. And look, the po opposite side is connected to the bus bar. Whoop. The positive side is connected to the bus bar. Okay, I must be hitting some button that I don't know. And, of course, the bus bar is positive. So we're going to be able to push electrons out and out of the negative. So this side always stays negative. Let's look at the other direction. If we produce current flow in the opposite direction, current flow will come up to here, go over to here. And, again, the electrons can't go up. They can't go with the arrow. They can only go away from it or opposite to it. So sure enough, it's negative. And we could look at all three of these output windings. And in every case, electrons can only go in one direction. So we're going to have electrons coming in. And of course, they can go through that direction. And we're going to have electrons getting pushed out. So this is where we, that's this rotating field that takes horsepower to, to cross, make the lines of flux cross the output winding. So there's our electromagnetic induction. There's our energy transfer. And again, the voltage regulator does the exact same thing in a DC alternator as it does in a DC generator in that it's measuring bus bar voltage and it'll change the strength of the field by letting more or less amps or electrons go through the field. Remember, it's got effectively, it's got that variable resistor in it. So that's the same. Ex everything from here to the left is the same, except the soft iron core has no retentivity whatsoever. So what that means is if the battery is not turned on, well, let's try that again. If the battery is not turned on, and I know it ought to be a relay, but I'll put it in here. 
if the battery is disconnected and this is open then no amps from the battery can go through the field so no amps through the field no lines of flux from the field if the core is made out of soft iron and has no retentivity at all and it has no lines of flux uh, either then neither the field nor the core have any lines of flux so if the core is in here and the field is in here too and it's spinning around there's no lines of flux coming off of it that means that electromagnetic induction doesn't work because we need we need lines of flux we need conductors and we need the relative motion well we got relative motion we got conductors but we're missing the line of flux so in order to get a DC alternator working we've got to excite it we've got to turn on the battery and let some of the electrons from the battery go through the field and now we'll get our lines of flux so now we'll have lines of flux in here to cross the output winding and once it gets going it can produce uh, amps of course and feed the field once it gets going you could actually turn off the battery and it would still work because the output windings or have electrons going through them, the diodes change it into from AC to DC and keep pushing electrons out of the negative side of the alternator, the core, the uh, ground, so these electrons could run through the field. And the voltage regulator could control it. And but we normally don't do that because we like having a nice charged battery. Let's see how much I missed. So we need an external current to get excited. So you could say that a DC alternator has to be externally excited. And the question is why? Because there's no permanent magnet. The core has no retentivity. So we're going to have to get it externally excited to get it going. Once it gets going, we don't need that anymore. Now here is the field. You remember, in an alternator, the field spins. So the field, as I drew it, is right here. So we're looking at this part, and we're looking at the core. So there's actually a brush, a brush that comes in here and a brush that comes in here. And so one of these goes to ground and the other one goes to the voltage regulator. And comes in here and a lot of windings and comes out here. So inside of there you can't see it very well are the wires or the electromagnet producing the magnetic field. And this right here is the soft iron core. Now what you'll notice is this thing is going to spin around and around and you'll notice there's no bumps on these copper slip rings right here so we can spin this thing around really really fast since this doesn't have any bumps we can actually spin this thing around close to 12,000 RPM and it'll still work really good remember that 12,000 RPM. Here is a picture you can see the slip rings right here and here are the, uh, the soft iron core and you can see it now you can see the wires inside there where the field is and now what you can see with this red insulation around copper wires these are the three output windings you'll notice we got one two three wires coming out and that looks just like the same number of wires we have right here one wire coming out two wires coming out three wires coming out So here is a picture of an alternator with the three output windings on the outside and it's hard to see but there's actually a little space between them and then in here is the field and the core that spin around and the, the brushes come in and touch the slip rings. Let's see if I have a very good picture. Here we go. We can look at it from the side. So we're going to have a brush come in here and a brush come in there and that part's going to spin around and around and around and in this case the output winding stays stationary and of course here's some fan blades so when it spins it'll blow air through the alternator and here is the other side of the alternator you can see the brushes there's a spring that pushes them in it doesn't look like it from here but they're actually offset one of these is higher than the other one is if we looked at it from this side right here we'd see one brush right here and the other one coming in at the other angle 
so they're not actually hitting the same place. And you can also see one, two, three, four, five, the six diodes. So you, that's the part that rectifies the, the alternating current into the direct current. And hey, what's nice, these brushes, since they don't have to hit a bumpy area, they don't wear down as fast in alternators as they do in generators. So now let's talk about low engine RPM effects uh, concerning an alternator. All right, here's our piston engine. And this is on a recip driving a propeller or a helicopter output and let's just say we bolt the alternator onto the back of it and again let's look at engine RPM and we need a red line and here's red line we'll say it's a little less whoops a little less and 3,000. Did I write a little more on the other one? In any case, a little less than 3,000. And so if we're going a little less than 3,000, what RPM are we going to want the, this alternator to go at? We're going to want it to spin around 12,000. You're probably figuring this out, huh? So what happens when we pull the engine down to 600 RPM? Remember, this is a recip, which equals 20% of redline. We're going to reduce this to 20% times 0.2. 2 times 12 is 24, and 2400. Sweet. So it's still going to spin around at 2400 RPM. So here's the question now. If 2400 RPM, let's remember, 2400 RPM, hopefully that stuff will go away, and I'll get the other stuff. Oh, I erased it. Yep. Okay. I'll get over it. I'll draw it again. If we have that same graph, except now red line is at 12,000 RPM, and here say is 6,000, and this is generator correction. This is alternator RPM and amps. Remember, the amps would come up, and by the time you got to 6,000, it was already cooking like crazy. Wow, if we pull it down to 2,400. Here's 3,000. Here's about 2,400 alternator RPM. Wow. Compared to 100%, we're producing the vast majority of that uh, amperage, even though the engine is at a low RPM. Since our gear ratio, instead of 2 to 1 with the generator, now it's about 4 to 1. So instead of pulling it back down to a, the alternator to a really low RPM, it's still spinning around at 2400 RPM, not 1200. So we can still get a whole lot of amps out of it, even though the engine is at an idle RPM. So therefore, in general, on aircraft that have a DC alternator, since we can spin an alternator around so much faster, even when we pull the engine back down to idle, the alternator is still spinning a reasonable speed, and we can get a lot of amps out of it, noticeably more than half of the rated amperage of the alternator. So we generally don't, even if we're at idle, have the low voltage light come on on an aircraft that has a DC alternator, even when we're on the ground and we have a whole bunch of stuff turned on. Now, there are some airplanes where you turn everything on for night. You got all the light, external lights on, the rotating beacon, the strobes, the position lights, the landing light, the taxi light, a whole radio stack turned on, all the lights on inside the cockpit. You may actually go a little bit past this. So it's impossible then on an aircraft with a DC alternator, you might get the low voltage light to come on, but you're going to have to turn pretty much everything on on board the airplane. So guess what? You might have to bump it up maybe to 800 RPMs to get a little more amps, but that's pretty unlikely with an airplane with an AC, uh, correction, a DC alternator. And we already saw these pictures. And we saw that picture. And we did that one. We looked at these. There we go. So low engine RPM effects? Nope. Because the d alternator is spinning so fast because it's now a small percentage of 12,000 RPM, not a small percentage of 6,000 RPM. Now, I already covered a lot of this already. Advantages of a DC alternator over a DC generator. Even if the engine's at low RPM, 
we can still get a whole lot of amps out of it. Since we're spinning it around at two times the speed of a generator, for the same size, if we spin it twice as fast, we can get about twice as many amps out of it. So we can have a lower weight alternator to put out the same amperage. And of course, excuse me, and of course I already mentioned about the brushes, since they're spinning around a smooth slip ring instead of a rough commutator, they are less likely to break and less likely to wear out fast. So alternators last longer between failures than generators do. Okay, low voltage or over war voltage warning lights. There's no picture to draw on airplanes. They're different. Uh, why are they there? You'll notice the purpose is exactly the same as a voltmeter, as an ammeter, as a hydraulic pressure gauge. It gives the pilot the con an indication of the system condition. Uh, but its function is different. Of course, in this case, it's telling you the pressure. It's essentially displaying. Uh, an indication that the pressure, the voltage, isn't what it's supposed to be. If it would make it easier for you to write voltage right here, or volts, that would be fine with me. It's not giving you an exact absolute number, but it's definitely telling you that the volts are too high or too low. Avionics bus, wow, that one's really tough. It's a bus bar. And, of course, the generally accepted reason why we have bus uh, avionics separate avionics buses so that we can disconnect it from the main bus so that when we turn off or turn on the alternator generator if the voltage goes a little too high or too low it won't negatively impact the, all the avionics and won't damage them so how does it do it what's its function it isolates them and of course the other nice thing is that you don't have to turn all the darn switches off you can flip one switch and they all turn off and you can sw flip one switch and they can all come back on again current limiter the uh, electrical symbol for a current limiter looks like this. And it's essentially two black arrows filled in, pointing towards each other. Well, it's not as pretty as I had intended. There we go. So there's our current limiter. You'll notice the purpose why it's on board the aircraft is identical to that of a circuit breaker and a fuse. It's there to keep wires from getting too hot and causing a fire. You'll also notice that the function is almost exactly the same, except we've added something for a long time. Current limiters, there's a lot of different ways to have current limiters. One of them is to have a slow blowing fuse or a slow operating circuit breaker. And typically, we're going to, and I don't have to memorize these numbers, but 30 seconds to a minute, it's going to wait. It's designed to uh, allow something to have extra amps go through it for a little while but then at some point it's finally going to go okay something's really wrong and it's not getting corrected so it's going to open up the circuit so if too many amps go through it but that's the big difference so be careful a circuit current limiter is very similar to a circuit breaker or fuse as far as pilots are concerned but it takes a much longer time before it pops or before it blows Okay, here is the DC alternator generator circuit. So you might want to hit pause and draw this out and then uh, hit play again and I'll tell you all about it. Okay, in this chapter we've covered a lot of things. For instance, we've already talked about the voltage regulator. And the DC alternator or DC generator and of course the current limiter and these look like a lot of different things so we could have the uh, low or high voltage warning lights And I'm not going to ask you to draw that symbol because everyone looks different. And of course, we're going to have the avionics bus. So the other stuff that's drawn here, uh, you've already seen before. Of course, this is going to be labeled probably. And this, of course, is the main bus. And here, inside of dotted lines, that's the relay. Of course, we have a battery, and 
we got conductors and grounds. Here's a single pole, single throw switch. Here's a single pole, single throw switch. Hey, wait. Single pole, single throw switch between the voltage regulator and the generator. Well, let's just say. Dun, 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 dun. Here's our variable resistor. So, the, when you're in a uh, light aircraft, here, right here, this is essentially the electrical master switch. And really, all you're doing with that electrical master switch is energizing a relay so that the positive side of the battery gets connected to the bus bar, so the bus bar is hot, or positive, and of course the negative side of the battery is always connected to ground. So when you connect the electrical master switch, when you close it, or turn it on, or make a complete circuit, this energizes, we get lines of flux, pulls the metal plate down, and now anything that's hooked up to the bus bar is connected to the positive side of the battery. That's really all you're doing is connecting the positive side of the battery to the bus bar or disconnecting the positive side of the battery to the bus bar. You'll notice that uh, this switch right here, this is the alternator switch. If you're, you're used to flying a 172 or a Robinson R22, then that alternator switch is really just disconnecting the voltage regulator from the generator and that field winding in here interesting way to use. I know there's an L in there somewhere. That field winding in there, if you disconnect it, how many lines of flux are you going to get off of it? None. So how much is this generator or alternator going to produce in amps? None if it's an alternator. And in a generator, even though there's that permanent magnet, we're talking 0.1 amps if it's got a permanent magnet in it. So that's effectively none. So you can turn the generator or alternator off by opening and closing the alternator switch because you're effectively opening up the circuit to that that uh, magnetic field and so now if there's no lines of uh, no amps going through it you won't get any lines of flux no lines of flux no electromagnetic induction no electromagnetic induction no electromagnetic induction no amps being produced okay you also notice that there's a circuit breaker here to the voltage regulator and let's just say for fun it says 5 on it well, if we use our rule of thumb and multiply by 0.7, that means really, under maximum conditions, only 3.5 amps is going through it, which means that's how many amps it takes to run the field if the generator or alternator was producing 100% of its rated amperage. So usually that's like 5 or 7 amps, so it's usually like 3.5, 4, or 5 amps, not very much. Of course, also in line to the generator, we have our shunt. And of course we have our ammeter. And of course you notice this circuit breaker right here, this T means we can pull it out if we want to. The circuit breaker right here, since it doesn't have the T on it, that means if we wanted to we couldn't pull that circuit breaker out. Okay, I think I got everything in there I want. Oh yeah, alright. So let's look at this next one. Low voltage indications versus high voltage indications. Well, if the voltage goes too low, we'll probably get a low voltage warning light. If we had a voltmeter, it would go below that 13 and a half or 14 or go below that uh, 27 or 28. So if we had a voltmeter and normally it's 13 and a half or 14 or if it's a 24 28 volt system it's 27 to 28. If the voltmeter goes down say to 12. Point six, whoops. If the voltmeter goes down to 12.6 in this system or if it goes down to uh, 25.2 if it's in a higher voltage system this these are the voltages of the battery I did it again those are the voltages of the battery so that's telling us hey we're running off of battery power and of course as the battery discharges the voltage is going to go down and we'll talk some more about that when we get to battery indications also if it's a low voltage the lights may start going dim the lower the voltage goes, the more likely the avionics, the radios, are going to go. Uh, I can live with lights that are a little dim. I can't live quite so easily with avionics that crap out. So that's actually the first thing I'd be worried about would be the avionics going out. High voltage indications. Obviously, the high voltage light could come on. The voltage, the voltmeter could go above 13 and a half or 14 or above 27 or 28. The lights could get bright. They're, they're going to burn out sooner if, they, if the voltage goes too high. And it's also possible that the avionics might stop working. Over voltage relay. There's a lot of aircraft, they put this over voltage relay into the voltage regulator, and it's essentially an electromagnetically operated single pole, single throw switch. So that if the voltage gets really, really high, 
say above 18 or above 32, something like that, it actually opens the circuit effectively the same way that the alternator does. They put in another switch right here, and that relay, it's, I mean, it's really operated. If the voltage goes too high, that opens up. I erased the whole thing. Sorry about that. In any case, it'll open up the circuit, and now it turns the generator off, because typically you can't get an over-voltage unless the generator is putting out too many amps. Okay, let's say you go out to the airplane and the battery's dead. You turn on the master switch, and the turn coordinator doesn't make much noise, and you might not even notice if the, uh, as long as the lights come on, because in the daytime you don't really know how dim they are anyway. So you go out to start the engine and it goes and the battery's dead. If you know that the master switch had been left on and the battery was just dead, <clears throat> excuse me, because somebody left it on, then you go, okay, fine. I know what happened. The battery's okay. <coughs> excuse me. I'm just going to get a jump start and uh we'll get the engine going and uh when the alternator kicks in, it'll charge the battery. But if you go out to the airplane and the battery's dead and you try to start it and it won't start and you don't know why the battery is dead, you don't know for sure that somebody just left the master switch on, then you don't really know what's wrong with the battery. It might just be dead from somebody leaving the master on, but it might be dead because of an internal battery issue. So unless you know what it is, that battery is unairworthy, and you need to make a decision. If the battery's unairworthy, can I go on this flight? That'll be a question that you'll need to think of as a pilot in command. Okay, let's talk about, just for a short moment, we're going to talk more about it in another chapter, about a complete failure of the alternator or generator. You're going to run the checklist. Hey, we all got a checklist. And essentially, what's going to happen on the checklist is it's going to tell you to operate this here switch. It's going to make sure that the battery electrical switch is turned on so that the battery, the positive side of the battery is hooked to the bus bar. You're going to make sure you're going to cycle this switch. It'll probably tell you to make sure that this circuit breaker is working. If it's the kind you can pop in and out, I'm probably going to pull it in or out a couple of times, and I'm going to open this switch a couple of times. If that doesn't do it, I might decide, maybe, to operate the electrical master switch once or twice. Depends on, you know, if I'm talking to somebody on the radio, I'm certainly going to let them know before I turn off the master switch because the avionics won't work because the avionics, even if it's turned on, if this main bus bar doesn't have any power from coming from the generator and it doesn't have any power coming from the battery because I turned the switch off, I'm gonna the avionics aren't going to work, so I'm going to have to tell somebody before I turn the master switch on. And that's mostly all you can do. Of course, now you're going to shed unnecessary electrical loads. You're going to turn things off you don't need, and you're going to be concerned about how long is this battery going to last, which we'll talk about that in another chapter. And you want to make sure that nothing is discharging the battery that you don't need. So you're going to turn off extra things that you don't need, and you're going to open this alternator switch or generator switch. And if I have the kind of circuit breaker that you can pull out by hand, I'm going to open it as well. Because the voltage regulator, remember in there, it's a ver essentially a variable resistor. So if it reads the voltage as being really low, then it's going to reduce the the if this switch is closed and the circuit breaker is closed, it's going to reduce this, the resistance in the circuit to try to allow lots of amps to go through this field. Well, amps could leave the battery and go through the field, and you could drain the battery at, you know, three, four, five, six amps, and you want to save that power. Now, in theory, inside of that alternator are those diodes that won't let the electrons go through there backwards, but oh wait, no, this is the correct direction. So the voltage regulator ought not to be allowing this to occur, but I'm asked suggesting if you if it's not on the checklist, open the alternator switch and if it's possible, pull that alternator circuit breaker, but only do that after you follow the checklist and taken every step possible to try to reset the alternator or the generator. So that's that part right here. And of course paralleling circuit. That's if you're on a multi engine airplane you've got more than one alternator and generator. Effectively, it's a wire between the voltage regulators so that the voltage regulator so that the voltage regulator connected from one generator will get connected to the voltage regulator on the next one. 
so that the voltage regulator will allow the same number of amps to go through this field as the same number of amps that are going through the field on this generator. So both of the generators or alternators will put out the same amperage. So wherever that needle goes on one, it'll go to the same place. So that way one generator isn't uh, going to wear out faster than the other one is. And there's no switch in the cockpit. I've not seen one. If, if you turn one generator off, you don't have to worry about it affecting the other generator. Thank you.